Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just waiting because we've got people I can see still joining. We've got an enormous number of people, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, so I'm just going to give it a couple of minutes while the numbers of participants are still going up. Um, and then I will formally open the event and let you all know what's happening. Well, we've reached 150 now, so I think that's brilliant. Uh, and I'm going to kick off. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm Polly Neat. I'm the Chief Executive of Shelter. And I'm really delighted to welcome you to the launch of Peter Beresford's book, Participatory, I'm just getting it, she? Participatory Ideology from Exclusion to Involvement, which is published this week by Policy Press. Um, you might be wondering what I'm doing uh, here. Um, and the answer is, it's an absolute honor uh, to be asked to chair this event. Um, I first met Peter Beresford about, it actually is about 30 years ago uh, when I was a journalist. And it's quite fitting because I was writing a piece because I still remember the interview really clearly about the impact of housing policy on compounding policy and disadvantage. Little did we know where we would end up, frankly. I certainly didn't think I would end up Chief Executive of Shelter. I still uh, can't believe I'm so lucky, um, but um, it makes me even more honored to be uh, invited by Peter to chair this event. And this book could hardly be more timely, quite frankly, because ideological conflicts seem both more polarized and in, I think some people's minds more democratized, maybe because of social media, but um, that democratization or democracy, I, I think is quite illusory because of the exclusion of voices that should really matter the most. And as we emerge into a much changed world, I think Peter's thinking, as it always has done uh, for me, gives us ideas that will really help those of us who are hopefully there to make a difference. So I'm really delighted to be able to introduce our speakers today. So our first speaker will be, of course, Peter Beresford, uh, author of the book. Peter is visiting professor at the University of East Anglia, and he's also co-chair of Shaping Our Lives. Uh, Peter will be followed by Mary Murphy, who is Professor of Sociology at Maynooth University in Ireland. Uh, then Mary will hand over to Raza Griffiths, who's an independent service user consultant. And she will then hand over to Professor Dan Goodley. Uh, he, sorry, <laughs> Raza, I do beg your pardon there, will hand over to Professor Dan Goodley of the School of Education at the University of Sheffield. So, uh, without further ado, uh, just a quick bit of housekeeping from me and then I will hand over to Peter. Um, just to say, just so everyone's aware, this webinar is being recorded. Peter, Mary, Raza and Dan will talk for five minutes each and then the panel will discuss their contributions. And I'll be putting your questions to the panel. So please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen if you have questions. And if a question occurs to you during the panel discussion, um, you can put it in the Q&A function right away, uh, but I won't come to it until the end of the panel. And um, if you have any technical issues at all, please alert Policy Press using the chat function. And uh, details of how to order Peter's book at a 50% discount will also be available in the chat function. So thank you all so much for coming. I'm really looking forward to listening to our speakers um, and to the Q&A. And I'm now going to hand over to Peter. Thank you. Thanks ever so much, Polly. And thank you, all of you, for being here as panelists. And thanks, everyone, for, for taking part in this, in this uh, workshop, this launch uh, session. And I'm going to have to use notes. I always have to. Um, I hope this is just to introduce uh, the event for everybody how I've got to where I've got. The focus of my work has been about trying to make sense of people's participation or their user involvement. And that began and was reinforced by my realization 
that both major strands of prevailing approaches to public policy were essentially exclusionary. That's to say, left of center Fabianism prescribed what it saw as good for people, top down, and then more and more right-wing market-based neoliberalism promised people control and choice as consumers, which most are unable to achieve through the market. Movements of service users, meanwhile, began to demand a real say and involvement. And me thinking this through, I began to realize, of course, that participation is heavily ideologically based itself. It can have very different meanings. But then I was alerted to the fact that, of course, ideology also connects with and relates to participation. It may be developed in participatory or excluding ways. The, what was like a, a light bulb for me was to realize that essentially uh, it, its development in our lives more generally tends to be very exclusionary. It has been, it still is. We mostly have little or no say in the ideologies that dominate our lives and in some cases actually can end them. So my aim with this book was to problematize this. Nobody else seemed to have realized that this was actually an issue, to highlight it as an issue and to ask, how can there be ideology, for example, for social justice, uh, progressive ideology, uh, if people don't really have any say in it? And if particular groups, as Paul has already suggested, are especially likely to be excluded and marginalized? And second, how can we make progress, real progress, on securing that involvement? especially at a time like now, when there seems to be a kind of a logjam around ideology. I think the key is to learn from the new social movements that have developed, who've been seeking to do that from black civil rights movements of the, of the 60s onwards, onto disabled peoples and survivor movements now too. So I think what we need to do is to support and ourselves be involved in inclusive movements that relate to us, developing their own, our own ideology through self-organization in terms of the values, the goals, our identity, our experience, our knowledge for means and ends for change in line with our rights and needs that begin at last to give us some real connection with the ideologies that infiltrate our lives in every possible way. I'll stop there and now I'll hand over, if I can please, to Mary. Hi, Peter. Congratulations on the book and, and thank you for the invitation to speak. I, I've had the opportunity to read the book and I'd, I really loved it. It really spoke to me and it also challenged me quite a lot, both personally and I think professionally. I suppose I have a tendency to be a bit of a Fabian in my background, so I did find some of it quite challenging, but I, I really liked it nonetheless for that. Um, I really liked some of the quotes. They really stayed with me. Um, Berman's an idea is something you have, but an ide ideology is something that has you really got me thinking. Um, and I think that 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 basic light bulb moment, if you like, in the book that you describe, where you recognize that, you know, the creation of ideology is generally an elite process, an exclusionary process. And the genius of the book is how do people enable themselves to participate in the creation of their own ideologies and that basic challenge, which gets us all thinking. And I think the book is a really honest discussion of that. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You're willing to accept half a loaf in looking at the untidiness and the difficulty in self-organization. And you're very hopeful. And I think that's really important. I think hope is a political choice. It's a political position. And I think being mindful of the difficulties, but being still hopeful is really important. And I think you're, you're, you're mindful of the difficulties that there are in some of the new social movements of the non-hierarchical nature and the, the, the ideas around structure and trying to avoid heavy hierarchical structures bring their own challenges of mobilizing and organizing. And I suppose in my own personal experience of that, I would have been involved in the 1980s and 1990s in mobilizing movements of the unemployed rather than for the unemployed. And I remember very clearly the, the really difficult battles we had of maintaining the space of a movement rather than for a group, you know, in a term, terms of other people being paternalistic um, and left of centre in trying to do things for a group and not giving them the space, the voice, 
um, and the skills and the capabilities to do things themselves. Um, I'm involved at the moment in social movements around eco-socialism. And I think what's really interesting there is that I can see the attempt to develop an ideology of eco-socialism, both from the ground up in terms of people involved in ecological movements um, and in, in, in practice in econo ecological spaces, trying to develop an ideology out of their practice, but also then the need to engage sometimes with academics, with elites, with political actors in order to build that movement. So there's the tension between the balance, I think, across both types of engagement that can be quite interesting. And I think effectively, you know, we need to cross the river by stepping on each stone so that there isn't really a template or a blueprint that we need to learn from and listen to each other. And I noticed, I mean, there's some, some parts of the book where you talk about, you know, participatory action research is kind of maybe seen by some as a methodology of doing that, but you're rightly quite critical in the book of, you know, that people are quite suspicious of some of those methodologies in terms of how they're experienced on the ground. And you acknowledge as well that some of the citizens' juries or citizens' assemblies, the deliberative spaces that are emerging for groups to engage in policy and ideology are often quite state-controlled spaces. And I think the experience of Ireland is interesting in that regard because we've had quite state-controlled spaces where in fact the citizens have almost taken them over. And we've had recent examples and referendums on um, marriage equality or reproductive rights, where in fact the state owned and state created spaces were taken over by the people to some degree. And the state was not in control of the agenda that was being driven by the citizens from those places. I think there's really interesting lessons there that might be applicable that, you know, to future processes like that. So I think some of the, some of the difficulties I see that, that emerge from reading the book are how, how you manage the space between these new non-hierarchical spaces, Black Lives Matters, um, organizations like that and then the difficulty of old more moderate movements who yet have skills and experience that might be usefully tapped into and how they don't become exclusionary to each other so i've probably gone quite into my five minutes by now so i'll hand over at this stage to Razu Griffiths thank you you're on mute Raza so sorry about that. Thank you very much, Peter, for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. And I reflected on the book um, uh, and I really enjoyed it in the light of my, my own experiences of mental distress and using mental health services, having been a mental health activist and looked at intersectional issues of race, sexual orientation. And it really got me thinking. I think that's the aim of this book. What, how can we go forward? What are some of the key priorities for action in creating a more uh, democratic form of participation. So I've actually come up with some, some kind of key themes and I, I'd like to relate those uh, if I may. Um, particularly in mental health, what's happened is that the opportunities for mental health service user activists to come together and get identification, share narratives, identify with each other and on that basis, develop the solidarity to create a, a, a kind of ideology. It is actually being taken away um, because of the destruction of some of the infrastructure service user groups. So we really need to address that and think of new ways that we can connect up using the internet and other ways. Um, another thing that really is very important is to raise the consciousness, I think, of the different forms of participation between the consumerist and, and the democratic, because often what happens is that people are not really aware that there is a more democratic form of participation. Um, and there are tools that um, survivors and mental health service users have helped to develop that um, kind of help us see that. And there's 4PI, there's the um, DTOOTS Charter, which was developed by BAME, mental health service users, to equalize some of the power imbalances so they can have a real and genuine stake and uh, say in, in participation. Um, in, in terms of race and ethnicity, I think one of the things that really needs to happen is that the school curriculum, we need to really 
help students to develop a more critical awareness of diversity and particularly the legacy of, of colonialism, particularly at this moment. I mean, it's happening in academia, it's happening in certain spaces, but it's not been mainstreamed. I mean, I know more about 1066 than the 200 year history of the British in India, and I think that's terrible. Um, we also, I really like, um, PC, your focus on this idea that we need to challenge this idea that people are epistemologically suspect, that we can't know things. We really, and particularly in mental health, we need to continue to problematize this prevailing notion of incapacity, as well as this positivist notion that, and you highlighted this, of reliable knowledge being very distant from experience, you know, because the knowledge that we have of having directly experienced mental distress and of using services, it should be valued more. This is the problem, but it's not valued. And I looked at the, um, the party political manifestos from the last election, and while some parties pay lip service to, you know, mental health, we need to put it on the agenda, none of them actually challenge the fundamental power bases that we're dealing with, you know, in terms of the biomedical model. None of them critique that. So there needs to be um, uh, the, the political critique of the biomedical model needs to be center stage in terms of mental health policy and practice. I mean, there are positive developments such as the United Nations um, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which was not referenced um, in any of the manifestos. So that's an oversight. Um, I think it's really important at this time to remember that we have had triumphs. We need to kind of um, uh, memorialize our triumphs, our, 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 the positive things that we've done in terms of, you know, social model of disability. That was really profound. So we mustn't lose sight of that to, to um, raise our morale. Um, at this point in time, I think it's really important that we politicize the debate um, uh, around the unequal impact of COVID, because this is highlighted as never before, the socioeconomic inequalities underlining our society, which can't be washed away by just saying we're all in this together. And we very much need to develop alliances with activists campaigning in other fields, race, uh, um, uh, gay rights, uh, women's rights, all of these things, trans rights, um, in order to democratize, democratize our own movements, but also to ensure that these other movements put mental health at the center of their agendas as well. Um, I think we also need to think about sometimes direct action. Um, I mean, it needs to be part of a wider strategy, but sometimes toppling a statue can actually initiate very, very important and long overdue debates. Um, so the other thing I wanted to stress is that because we're talking about participation and feelings of exclusion, sometimes what is left out is the whole kind of national populist agenda, which I believe is driven by a sense of resentment at, an, at a feeling of being excluded. So what we need to do is we somehow need to engage with that. I mean, there may be people whose political views we, we, we don't actually agree with, but I think what would be helpful as a bare minimum is not to kind of call such people stupid, because I think that that serves to alienate and possibly radicalize people further. So, um, Peter, I just wanted to thank you. I think I'm coming up to the end of my five minutes for um, inviting me on this panel and for helping to initiate a debate on what needs to happen next in terms of participation. Thank you. Dan, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Raza. Um, Thanks for the opportunity to speak to mark the publication of Peter's new book. I can't really think of anyone better than Peter to write a text that values people's knowledge and expertise in relation to ideology, explores its conventional social construction, but also the counter ideology. And now we can link this to participation. Uh, Peter's always had a commitment to outlining a practical guide, if you like, and it's typical of his work. And, and this work is about uh, generating ideas through co-production with others. So I think this is a, a classic kind of uh, example of Peter's work, which is around praxis. And he's always pushed against the ivory tower model of research that obviously puts universities kind of dislocates them from their social moorings. And he's always asked how we might centralize expertise by experience, activist knowledge, 
and the work of organic intellectuals of disability mad politics. But I also welcome Peter's uh, ways in which he's kind of linked this uh, to wider um, activism around Black Lives Matter and also the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and I want to briefly respond to this typically Berard's Fordian challenge. I think, is, is that a thing, a Berard's Fordian challenge is now? By just drawing very briefly on a paper that I've co-authored with some colleagues, Rebecca Lawton, Kirsty Lydiard and Catherine Ronswick Cole. Clearly we're living in times marked by human precarity, but we need to obviously, as Peter attends or pushes, to, pushes us to recognise, is that this precarity is neither shared, universal nor new. And the global demonstrations, in light of the murder of George Floyd, are reactions to years of institutional racism. We found in the summer of 2020, for example, that people with learning disabilities in England were three to six times more likely to die of COVID. And we know that poor homeless and dispersed people are disproportionately affected by the pandemic. And if whilst often it's easy to explain this in terms of the unprecedented impacts of COVID, we know that black, poor and disabled people have been dis disproportionately affected by years of systemic discrimination, underfunded research, health and education and social care services, and of course, austerity. So devalued humans are routinely dehumanized. And now more than ever, these realities are gaining traction in the mainstream media. So how can we as researchers engage with these intersectional politics? So very quickly, we identify a number of projects which I think link very neatly with what Peter's advocating in his book. The first is that we need to subject the normative, the hegemonic, and the taken for granted to endless analysis and critique. We would want to ask, what is this strange, freakish, normative education system, for example, that upholds the authority of a certain kind of learner? So, which is, of course, the, you know, the best learners in education, the white, middle class, heterosexual, reasonable, speaking a standard language, living in towns, Western European settler subjects with a deep rooted colonial ancestry. So if you've got all of those things, you're going to do OK in the British education system. The second project is to endlessly acknowledge and address the ways in which Sylvia Winter calls uh, the ways in which social systems impose a collective ontological sense of wrongness of being. I mean, how often do we hear from disabled children, for example, that they feel they do not belong in educational systems, that their ontologies, their sense of who they are, is actually deemed as wrong. But this is not simply a call for recognition. This is about challenging the alienating tendencies of our educational institutions. The third is to borrow from the work of Franz Fanon and Sylvia Winter and argue that we need to promote a sociogeny of disability in education. Do not assume that education, um, nor disability, nor blackness are pre-social, apolitical, objective, independent, universal. They're not. They're anything but this. Education creates racism and disabledism, and we need to challenge this. Part of this project links to the fourth, which is challenging the epistemic privilege of global North ideas. And, and um, Peter's book is a, is a um, offering us this opportunity to change the ways in which dominant knowledge always seems to you know, be upheld as coming from Western metropolitan contexts. And of course, we can turn to many, many post-colonial writers who've argued that we need to create what Mignolo calls epistemic disobedience. And finally, I just want to, uh, to finish with the idea that what we need to do is to disavow the category of the humanist human. Too often what people understand as being a human being is absolutely shot through with very normative, very narrow ideas of what it means to be a fully functioning citizen. And so Peter's book is setting as a challenge to, to, to ask a very simple question, but of course a difficult question at the same time. What does it mean to be human and what kinds of human, human beings are valued in, by uh, contemporary society and dominant ideologies? Thank you. So much food for thought there that I really enjoyed listening to all of you. Thank you so much. Um, I, uh, yeah, I mean, so many ideas there. I loved uh, Mary's point about the balance between movement building and interacting with elites. That's something that is incredibly relevant to me in my work at Shelter, actually, and I struggle with that balance all the time. Um, so much in what Raza said, in particular, the reminder that he gave of the uh, intersections, I guess, between 
uh, movements like the mental health movement and then uh, the rights movements that we've seen uh, growing up um, in more recent times uh, particularly and then the unequal impact of the COVID pandemic of course and I felt like Dan really picked that up as well talking about the terrible impact of COVID on people with learning difficulties in particular and also that sense of not belonging and the alienating institutions that perpetuate that, um, I found that incredibly powerful. So thank you, all of you. I'm going to turn to the Q&A um, and I'm going to put uh, the first question to you, Peter. Um, and it's from Colin Slasberg. And Colin says, um, what are the panel's thoughts about how can we engage the participation of people in receipt of public services in changing the ideology that drives those services when the prevailing ideology demands the deference of their service users. That word deference is really powerful, isn't it? Um, and it, as a service provider, it's uh, quite a salutary word to reflect on, I've got to say. What, what would your response to that be, Peter? Well, it's a very incomplete response because my, my, my experience tends to be that um, People begin to get organized to connect with others with experience like their own when things have got bad. Uh, and things have to impact hard on your life for that to be so. It has to be close to who you are, your, your nature as a human being or those who are close to you. But you can also move to a state, a state where it is so bad that you haven't got the energy or the time to do that in all likelihood. And I, I, I do feel that the process of disempowerment uh, is a kind of a political process which um, gathers power as it goes along and makes it more and more difficult for people to resist the pressures on them and to cope with the day-to-day -day difficulties and responsibilities of their lives. And we, are, we have been so effectively isolated. I think I'd, I'd probably turn to, to something that, um, that, that uh, Dan said, I think we need to challenge everything. I'm, I'm absolutely amazed that we have a situation where we have a mass media that actually it's difficult to talk about as a mass media. You know, newspapers that sell unbelievably small numbers compared with what they sold, let's say, 30 years or even 20 years ago. I know they have websites, but those actually might be redefined as comics often. I mean, we need to think about what we mean by the, the mass media. And yet, of course, then there is the BBC, a legitimated organisation which we pay for, which then acts as a, an amplifier every day, constantly, of what this tiny little grouping of so-called mass media run by a tiny number of fingers group of people. And that's given enormous power. And it, it has enormous power invested in it by most of us. I have to resist that power, even though I understand it. I think we have to challenge everything. And many of us are in a poor position an increasingly poor position to make that challenge because life is difficult, our educational opportunities have been restricted and we are trying basically to get by. And I think that's when the responsibility of those of us who are more privileged to connect with those sorts of experiences and to make it more possible for them to be accessible, accessed and shared becomes particularly important. We really need to, to regard things as a matter of, at least in our case, we are trying to be all in it together. We may not be in terms of suffering, but in terms of not taking space, but trying to support others to gain their space, we have a role to play. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try and make sure all the panellists get to respond to some uh, questions. So I'm going to move through the questions relatively quickly. And the next one, I thought I would start with you, Mary, if that's all right. And um, this is from Sarah Markham, and she says, is there a danger of creating further barriers to making progress by adopting certain political or ideological stances? Is there a danger of creating further barriers uh, by adopting certain political or ideological stances? I mean, to the degree that is Peter's argument in the book that if those ideologies are already created through exclusionary processes and don't reflect the, the epistemic knowledge of 
you know, the, the, the group of people who you're trying to inquire into the ideology, then I think there are dangers in it. I'm always taken with Emma Goldman's, um, which apparently she never said, but it's a famous phrase. If I can't dance, I don't want to be in your revolution. But I think there is that sense of if you can't see yourself in what is being espoused, that it can be very negative and it can be a real um, turn off for an attempt at political participation or a first step into that forward is often blocked by language and ideologies that seem alien and seem foreign. And I'm minded of what Raza was saying there about, you know, that the being able to listen to people's experiences and opinions, even if you don't particularly think that you can engage with them or agree with them is very important as well in starting points for that. And I think when we don't do that, there are dangers in how things will turn out for those attempts at doing it. So I, I think it's really important that people see and hear themselves in the discussion and that that can only happen if the discussion is is actually grounded in their own experience. Um, and, and not all ideological discussions, of course, are. And neither are all political attempts at, at mobilization and that. So yes, I mean, I do think that there are dangers. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Raza, there's a, there's a question specifically for you here. Um, I'm skipping down. I am going to go back to the other questions before this in a minute. Um, but uh, Mary Eastman says, um, I miss the name of the charter Raza mentioned, which was developed by BAME service users. I'd like to hear more about this resource if possible. So could you just come in and just talk a little bit more about that charter, please? Um, um, da Dancing to Our Own Tunes Charter was a charter developed by BAME mental health service users about a decade or more ago, I think. Um, looks at uh, uh, rectifying some of the power imbalances that exist when, for example, a large commissioning organization, it could be a BAME voluntary organization, or it could be a mainstream NHS uh, mental health trust, commissions or asks a smaller um, BAME mental health service user led organization to do some work for them. And um, what it highlights is that the power imbalance actually adversely affects the kind of work that organize and that organization will be hamstrung by the power imbalances. And what we need to do is to, if you like, have a charter that sets out the terms of work uh, and engagement between those two organizations. So um, I can send details of that, but it's called the Dancing to Our Own Tunes Charter. And it's specifically about um, rectifying some of the power imbalances that exist. And one thing I wanted to emphasize, particularly in the case of BAME mental health service users, is that it's not just about disadvantage due, th due to ethnicity or social deprivation or other things like that, but it's also due to the disadvantage that comes from having a mental health diagnosis. So for example, you could have a BAME voluntary organization and there will be a power imbalance there there may be paternalistic attitudes there that disadvantage BAME mental health service users. And the phrase that I've heard used is that we exist in a kind of liminal space, you know, being mental health service users, but also coming from disadvantaged BAME communities as well. Thank you. Um, Dan, I'm going to go back now to David Farnsworth's question. This is a huge one. <laughs> so uh, um, how can society begin to value the real experience of people over the ideologies of the professions and academics as well as politicians? And I guess that in a way, uh, to me, that goes a bit back to Peter's point actually about access to media as well and whose voices are amplified in the media because that clearly has an impact on this question. Um, but are you okay to address that, Dan? Thanks. So yeah, well, the first answer is read Peter's book uh, in response to that. Um, and and it's, I'm, just, I'm kind of joking, but not. I mean, one of the things that Peter's work is known for is co-production, but also about um, what you might call organic intellectualism. So the idea, you know, of drawing upon ideas that are developed uh, within kind of um, politicized organizations. And I think um, in response to this question, that is, is, I'm gonna flip it slightly by, it, let's take academia. 
how, to what extent is academia prepared to consider its knowledge generation, um, starting with the organic intellectualism and expertise by experience that exists in the communities. And those communities, by the way, are not just outside of universities, but are inside um, universities too. And one, one way of doing that is through real co-production, not this kind of, this, you know, I'd say quite limited idea that's been taken up in a very mainstream way, but by real co-production, where actually what we're doing is we're exploiting the university, we're exploiting its kind of made, you know, modes of production in ways that are servicing the ambitions and aspirations of the kind of um, people that David, I hope you're talking, I think you're citing in your question. So I think it's, you know, if you take, for example, the, the area of learning disabilities, and we think about supporting people with learning disabilities in better ways, it's always very curious to me that when the question, how do we support people with learning disabilities, the answer norm will start with, in my colleagues and my colleagues, with the answer, psychology or social worker, rather than, well, actually, you know, talk to self-advocacy groups who got, you know, years of expertise by experience. So I think it's a case of uh, decolonizing um, the kind of academic spaces with some of the kind of knowledge and co-produced knowledge and or organic intellectualism that uh, Peter's text is uh, drawing us to. Thank you, Dan. Um, Peter, there's two questions here that specifically reference the book itself. So I'm going to put these to you if that's all right. Uh, the first is, and I'm going to take them together. Um, the first is from Annabelle Brown and she says, uh, reflecting on discussions of the black experience, to what extent does the book discuss this and specifically the intersectional experience of black women in poverty? I understand that this is an analysis of participation, but to what extent does the participation of black women come forth in the book? Um, and that might be a topic you might want to address more widely. And then um, Aidan Chadwick says, or might be Alden, um, my eyesight, sorry if it, I've got that wrong. Uh, Peter, why did you use the term ideology rather than discourse? Discourse connects easily to concepts of power, knowledge, power imbalance is crucial. So I'm just going to ask Peter to respond to those two. Before you do, Peter, just very quickly, um, I may not get to all the Q&A questions, but what I definitely won't be doing is taking questions out of the chat because I can't manage the chat and the Q&A. So if you have a question for the panel, please do put it in the Q&A rather than in the chat. Thanks everyone for your understanding on that. Right, Peter, over to you, sorry. Um, there's, there's a lot for me to remember there and I hope what I've done in the book is m make clear that I'm not speaking for black women, obviously, but to be drawing on the wisdom and experience and efforts uh, made by black women from different communities at different times and the lessons they've learned. And I have to say, I feel very indebted to uh, a number of organized black women for some of the conclusions that I've come to. But I, obviously I don't speak uh, fr from that perspective. I speak from my perspective, which if I sum it up is the perspective of obviously uh, a man who has had long-term experience of mental health issues, very damning experience of living on benefits and who is a non-believing Jew. Uh, uh, so I, that's all I can speak from. Uh, and I should say an enthusiast for old British motorcycles because I think, you know, that bit about dancing, we've got to remember all of who we are and, and proud to have four terrific daughters, and grandchildren. As for the second one, um, that's a really interesting question. I hadn't thought of talking in terms of discourse because if, if ideology is a, a, a difficult word, one, you're likely to get told off for being ideological if you express an opinion that's counter to another one. Secondly, I think many people, and I'd love to see serious quantitative research done on this, I think many people have little familiarity or confidence in responding to a word like ideology, which I think is terrifying because it does so much to us. And I think discourse is perhaps even a bit more uh, separate from people than ideology. I can't assume that they mean the same. I'd need to find out much more about discourse because when I wrote a draft of the book where I had some confidence about my knowledge and understanding of participation, 
but was a learner very much in relation to ideology. I quickly got told by the reviewers I needed to find out a lot more about ideology and had to write a second draft. So I, I think it's a, 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 there's a complex expert debate about ideology, and I don't doubt there's the same about discourse. And I think that that's another thing which perhaps I need to pay attention to. I couldn't do it in that book, and it wasn't where I was coming from, to be honest. Um, thank you, Peter. And while you're on the spot, I'm going to quickly just put Sally Witcher's question to you as well, if that's all right. Um, hi, Sally. Uh, it's really nice to hear from you, albeit virtually. Um, to what extent is this a matter of creating, through co-production, a new participatory ideology of co-production? And to what extent is it about achieving power shifts within existing ideologies and through that fundamentally changing them? To what extent is it new ideology and to what extent is it shifting power within existing ideologies? Peter. I think if we try and take seriously the implications of, of thinking about what, what level of participation there is in ideology, we begin after, after hundreds of years to, to refi, reframe what, what ideology might be about. I don't see how something which is essentially exclusionary and which you can be a stage army for will ever be empowering. Um, so I, I, I would go back to things that have been said by Ma Mary, and I think you, about how we try and connect um, struggles or organized activity which come from different places. I, when I was reading as part of writing this book about the black power movement in, um, and I have a real problem remembering names in, in the US in the 1960s, I came across the guy who was assassinated by uh, the FBI uh, in the States. Uh, who was one of the leaders and one of his absolutely determined efforts which goes along with what Raza was saying about listening to voices you might not want to hear in terms of their opinions was the way he tried to un unite black activists like the organization he was involved in with other groups white groups and others who were facing oppression but who were actually segmented against uh, the, the grouping he was part of. And I think, I think the visionary nature that that guy had uh, was one of the key reasons why he was chosen to be assassinated, because that's what we must do. Um, I think we must talk to each other. We have what I've described as a, a fatuous and marginal, but terrifyingly powerful mass media. And I think what we've got to do more and more is get rid of the intermediaries who tell us what each of us uh, is about who we are, why we should or shouldn't be here. I mean, I still can't get over, and it's so important, isn't it? When we talk about reality TV, what strange strangeness we are talking about. And, and then, uh, you know, when we even had it using the language of, of, of 1984 with Big Brother, uh, which is so significant. And yet the programme for me that always epitomised some attempt at perhaps would have been a more traditional understanding of reality with all its limitations as a program made when it was made in terms of gender, in terms of ethnicity was seven up. But what it was trying to do with its limitations admitted by its, its creators was try and let us be who we were in, 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 in communication on the media, which at that time, just as now was very far away from most of us. So there's, so there's so many things we need to address and connect. It's all, it really is about what those people say, the poets and the writers only connect and stop allowing people to disconnect you. That really is one of the lessons I've learned from doing this. Thank you. That was brilliant, a brilliant answer. I hope Sally agrees with that. Um, so I'm gonna um, ask Vaza now this question from Sopos Anikidze. She says, or he says, and I'm very sorry about uh, not knowing the gender of that name, it's quite common that service users' participation is token as they are considered as a vulnerable group. What could be done to avoid it and ensure their effective involvement while planning and getting services? Uh, did you get that, Raza? Do you want me to repeat it again? I do. I think um, that's a kind of million dollar kind of question. With our yeah. I think that's what we've been trying to do, but I think the problem is that, that 
there is, it, it feels like there isn't really any real intention to give power. This is the problem. Um, and so how do we, how do we get that power is, um, is really, it goes to the nature of everything really, doesn't it? It goes to the nature of the biomedical model, um, which doesn't value our knowledge, which actually says we don't have the capacity to actually have any valid knowledge. Um, it goes to the heart of the neoliberal ideology because it's not just about it's not just about how we're treated when we're unwell. That's one aspect uh, that we need to fight for because our human rights are being violated there. But it's also about the fact that our distress does not exist in isolation. Our distress exists at the nexus of so many forms of disempowerment and injustice. You know, as women, as as gay people, as people from racialized communities, as people from deprived communities. Um, and so the neoliberal ideology uh, stops us making all those links, because I think if we were able to really, if a mass movement were able to make those links, we would see that we are so powerful, we have so much behind us. But what, what happens is that we are atomized and fragmented by these ideologies. So um, how do you challenge those ideologies? I think Peter's book um, kind of addresses some of that, but um, I think that's what, what goes to the heart of it. And there are, other, there, there are other forms of disempowerment as well, because sometimes I think um, young men, I just wanted to say this, I think sometimes young men are not seen as part of a disempowered group because of patriarchy and all this, but one of the ways that young men are disempowered is actually by that very same patriarchy, which prevents people from uh, showing vulnerability and talking about how disempowered they feel, you know, as evidenced by the um, high rate of young male suicide. So I think a lot of people that you might think um, of as not being part of the disenfranchised are actually disenfranchised. But I think the trick of the system is it somehow, you know, sets one against the other frankly. So I, I realize that's not an answer, but I think that's the, that's what the problem is. And we need to somehow, I, and I think as Peter and others have said, we need to start talking. We need to start talking to some of those groups that we might not actually have uh, that much affinity with, because I think at the basis of a lot of it is a sense of anger and res resentment and a sense of not being able to participate um, in some of the key decisions that are affecting our lives. Thank you. I want to ask this question from Jim Elder Woodward. Jim, you've referred to DPOs. I'm assuming that means disabled people's organizations, but I don't actually know that. So I, I'm going to read your question, assuming it does. And I'm going to ask uh, Mary to respond initially. Please correct me in the chat or in the Q&A if I've got that wrong, okay? Uh, but the question I think is, how do disabled people's organizations build epistemic slash confidence capacity without resources? So Jim's talking about decades of austerity and obviously the cuts that many organizations have experienced. And then there's a, a, a subsequent additional point to his question. Uh, and he said, lived experience is often limited Capacity building must include widening horizons. And I thought that was an incredibly interesting point. Do you have some thoughts on that, Mary? Apologies. Yeah, I mean, just relating back to the previous, because um, I think it's connected is, yes. it's about if people are trying to build connections, not so much about around their identity, but around their lived experience. Mm -hmm. It's the very fact that, you know, the, and I think it's connected in terms of the, the conscientization of people is that stigma isn't an accident. It's almost inbuilt, designed into public services um, because it's necessary to keep people both disempowered and divided between each other. And I think that's the kind of thing that, yeah, you need consciousness raising, you, you need capacity building to not just share experiences of stigma, but actually to get over the next understanding of why it's there and why you're having those experiences and why other people are having those experiences as well. So I think that's really important. I think austerity absolutely gets in the way of it. 
Um, there's a, a blog up on the Social Transformations blog site actually looking at the degree to which the Irish experience of austerity has really impacted on the capacity of a lot of groups to actually be relevant in the context of COVID as well. You know, so the, the cuts that we experienced during, uh, you know, they really interfere with the ability to verbalize, to socially document what's going on in relation to COVID. Having said that, I think there is evidence that groups have found ways of doing it, um, whether it's information technology helping or whether it's simply learning to exchange those very common everyday experiences and have those conversations with each other, which can be done relatively cheaply if you're in, in you know, if you're in the mind and the space to do it. So I think organizations have found tricks of the trade, if you like, that take them beyond maybe the the interface with the state is less there, but beginning to talk to each other more. And certainly the experiences I mentioned at the beginning around good social transformation that happened in Ireland in the context of referendums, they happened and it's well documented. They happened because of conversations on the doorstep. That's what we call them, kitchen table conversations, taking risks to talk to each other, to talk to families, to talk to friends, to talk to neighbours. And that, that exchange of experience was epistemic disobedience. It created new knowledge. It created new, new ways of understanding. Um, and that was really important in those experiences. So I think they don't cost money, but they cost a lot in terms of your personal risk taking in terms of, uh, you know, if it doesn't go right. So they're not an easy thing to do and you need a movement to help you do it. But I think it can be done. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. That was um, great, actually. Uh, Rip, I found that incredibly useful. Um, I'm going to, so I'm not going to get through all the questions in the chat. I just want to, in the q and I just want to really flag that now. Um, I'm going to put one more question to Dan uh, right now. And then um, I'm going to ask each panellist just in two minutes, just to give some final closing thoughts. If you want to refer to any of the questions you can see as well as I can in the Q&A, feel free to do that. Uh, but just a couple of minutes. And Peter, I'm going to give you the last word as it's your book and all. Um, so Dan, uh, this question is from Alison Faulkner and she says, my recent work suggests that academia, academia has built higher barriers to participation in recent years. How do we democratize knowledge when simple things like the bureaucracy of payments are so difficult? <clears throat> yes, I'd agree with that. I mean, one of the, the biggest kind of uh, barriers to it, to including uh, disabled people in um, co-production research is around payments and around uh, the balancing around uh, benefits. I think it's very simple. We need to ensure that disabled people's organisations are involved from the outset in any kind of policy or new initiatives that are ongoing within universities, in this case around uh, research and innovation. Uh, too often, um, or big organisations like universities set up ideas um, and then later come back to consult with people. This is obviously the wrong way around. And so it's very simple. Uh, if you want to talk about inclusion, um, make sure that you're, work, you're working with organisations outside of the university who probably have got, you know, three decades of experience of already doing it. Thank you. Raza, I'm coming to you first for your uh, summing up, if you've got any final comments that you'd like to make. Um, I have lots of comments, but just related to the previous point, um, I think not everyone actually knows that, um, and, and I agree, the benefit system is set up in such a way that it, it's just basically meant to disempower us. And this can obviously impact on our ability to do work, particularly at university. I, I don't know if everyone is aware that um, there is a distinction between service user involvement activity, for example, and work. I mean, it allows a minimal amount of income. Um, and I, I can send um, guidance that kind of clarifies what that is. But the point is that not all service users know about it. Not all service users know about it. Therefore, they, they cannot take their experience, knowledge, insight and wisdom to um, universities, you know, where it can be picked up by, by students because of that lack of knowledge. But obviously that, that we're, we're not really meant to know these things, but, but there are kind of little ways round, but they just ameliorate the situation. I mean, that's not a, that, the, the, the situation is what it is, un, unfortunately. Um, but um, I just wanted to say that um, 
I'm, because, you know, I, 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 uh, Peter's book talks a lot about the importance of um, sitting around a table and talking with people and sharing, sharing stories, you know, in order to build new forms of knowledge and, 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 and solidarity. And I kind of am feeling the, the, the real lack of it because we also have a pandemic. We've had austerity, which has destroyed much of the infrastructure anyway. And now we have a pandemic, which um, I think for most people alienates people further and, and kind of pushes people back into their own uh, personalized disempowerment. But for me, that's just the neoliberal kind of world um, intensified. This is, this, is, this is life, unfortunately. But I just wanted to thank Peter and everyone else for being here because it's given me some sense of a you know, little bit of light coming through that um, by coming together, you know, sharing knowledge and experience, we can, we can develop forms of resistance you know, for the future. I think it's really important that we stay in touch. And I hope maybe we can have a kind of some kind of ongoing forum, you know, for people. I mean, there are what, 150, 200 people. So I think it might be an idea to kind of develop this and um, continue it. Thank you. Uh, Mary, any final thoughts from you? Very briefly. Yeah, I suppose it, it was the first thought as well as the final thought, maybe. Um, just page 12 of the book, there's definitions of ideology. And one of the definitions is a specification that's imaginative or visionary. And I think that's a really important part of ideology to hang on to. Um, it's true, I mean, Peter says it in the book, that it's really difficult to find good examples of really participatory ideological processes. I think if we look at the, you know, the 1960s, we maybe find a little bit more of them and the feminist movement. But I think we really need that imagination right now. We really need fresh thinking, new forms of knowledge. And um, that, that because all the ideologies that are available to us right now, none of them are really getting us to where we need to be. And whether that's on climate change, whether it's on racism, whether it's on poverty, you know what I mean? None of them actually give us the, the sort of the inspiration and the vital spark that we need. So I do think that the, the book's call for participation in ideology is actually really, really important. And history shows us that that's what creates real change is, is when people believe in the change that they're fighting for because it's their change. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Dan, last word, super brief, if you don't mind. I, mean, I was just struck by Rosa's point about distress existing at the intersections and to take up Mary's point, in order to, we need to continue our conversations, kitchen table conversations, online conversations in relation to those intersections. Brilliant, thank you. And Peter, finally. Well, I think I'm incredibly encouraged by, by today both by the number of people who've taken part been interested the number of the kinds of questions but also that we and this was not a, a hand selected group of people who would agree with me uh, we've, we've managed to find so much that there is to agree about to make change which relates to participation and ideology and I think that bodes really well because we will need to make fresh starts and I like people's thoughts that this is a process that should go on because that's something that I keep thinking about. I just want to say thank you to everybody. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I'm sorry I didn't get through all the questions. Thank you for joining us today. And of course, to Peter, Mary, Raza and Dan for their really, uh, I think, inspiring contributions. Um, details of how to order Peter's book at 50% discount, still available in the chat. Uh, Bristol University Press and Policy Press run a series of webinars on lots of topics. So have a look at their social media and their website for details. But for now, it was a real honour to be invited to chair this. Thank you, Peter. And thank you to everyone.